take your Bibles and open to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4 is what we're looking at here this evening, and I'm concluding this study from the book of Philippians tonight. And starting next Sunday evening, I am going back into the Gospel of Matthew as we are approaching the Easter season. We are going to look at Jesus as he is approaching the cross and the tomb. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm getting excited about that. And that'll start next Sunday evening. But Philippians chapter 4 is what we're looking at, beginning with verse 10, that I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. I want you to notice the very first word in that verse is the word but. It's a conjunction. And the word but is really, in my opinion, not necessarily the, the accurate conjunction that should be here because anytime you see the word but, you're thinking of it as being something that connects two clauses or two phrases and one contrasting the other. And uh, there is no contrast here because you look back at chapter 4, for example, in verse 4 of chapter 4, the apostle said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, Rejoice. Why would he then say, But as a contrast, to rejoicing. And, and, and then another one is verse 5. Let your moderation or your kindness be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. He goes on, be careful or don't worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And then he said, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall uh, keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. And then he said, finally, and Jesus, well, Paul was just like an average preacher. So he finally, and then keep on preaching for a while. But he said, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, if there be any virtue, any praise, think on these things. So why would he then start off with this paragraph symbol at verse 10 with a conjunction of but it really, in my opinion, ought to be the word now. But that's irrelevant to anything, and uh, the translators, as they put the, uh, the scripture together and the canon of scripture from the original manuscripts, they, I guess, seemed that uh, the word but was uh, appropriate here. But anyway, it says, but I rejoiced, or you could say, now I rejoice, in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again. What does Paul mean by that? You know, Paul, as a preacher of the gospel, could charge any church to, uh, to give him the finances he needed. But Paul, in his missionary journeys, was a tent maker. He made tents uh, along with friends like Aquila and Priscilla. And he made these tents and he sold them and he made his living off of that and that he would preach to these churches and he did not charge any of those churches, even though he had the right to do so as a called apostle. But nonetheless, there was one church that always gave him money, and that was the church of Philippi. Now, Paul is saying here, if you look with me in verse 10, he said, your care hath flourished. Again, it's kind of like, uh, think of a tree where the leaves die in the fall, and they're dead throughout the winter. In this springtime, they begin to bloom again as flourishing. He said, you're, you've now, you've given to me in the past, and now you, you have opportunity to give to me again, said Paul. And he was greatly appreciative of it, although he did not seek these monetary gifts. Now, when did they give to him before for him to say here, you have flourished again? There was a time. You see, he had started the church of Philippi, and then he went to other places. He went to the city of Corinth, and I've been preaching about the city of Corinth and the church of Corinth on Wednesday nights for several weeks now. But he had gone there, and we find that it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 
verse 9, these words. He said to the church of Corinth, he said, when I was present with you and I wanted, I was chargeable to no man. He's chargeable to no man because he made those tents when he's in Corinth. He said, for that which is lacking for me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supply. Macedonia, that's where Philippi was. The church of Philippi, the Philippians were in Macedonia. And he said, well, I was in Corinth and I did not charge any money for my preaching and my work there. Yet at that time, the church of the Philippians gave him a monetary gift. And we go on here and he says, now the time is here for you to give me a, to given to me again, said Paul. But if you look at verse 10, he said, it's not because he did not care. He said, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked the opportunity. You wanted to give to me, said Paul, but you didn't have an opportunity to give to me. What did he mean by that? When Paul left the church of Philippi, he had gone to other places. He went to Corinth, and the church of Philippi sent him money. And it had been a while since they had sent him money. And uh, Paul had some needs. And he said, now you've had the opportunity, you're having the opportunity to give to me again. Why didn't they have the opportunity before? Well, one reason why is because where Paul was and right now, when he's writing this, by, again, this is a Roman, uh, this is a, a prison epistle. Because at the time Paul wrote to the church of the Philippians here, he was in prison in Rome, chained to Roman soldiers. He was bound to Roman soldiers, knowing that he would possibly face execution while he is waiting to hear, have a trial, a hearing with the Roman emperor Nero. But he didn't know what was his fate would be. He had faith and he trusted God during this time. And do you know that the church of Philippi that he's writing to was about 800 to 1,200 miles away. He said, well, that's no problem. Get into the car. You can be there in a few hours. Get into a plane. You can be there a whole lot quicker. They didn't have cars and planes back then as we know. And most of their traveling was by walking. And the journey was treacherous. From Philippi to Rome, about 800 to 1,200 miles of rough terrain, of, of rocks and dirt and hills and wild animals and thieves waiting to ambush you, steal from you. It's dangerous, very dangerous in these journeys. And it was a long journey. So they didn't have opportunity to give to Paul when he had these needs because there's, there's a great distance away. Another thought is that perhaps the church of Philippi was going through financial struggles themselves and they could not afford to give yet. It, it might be even this, that in the days of no communication when they didn't have telephones back then, maybe, just maybe, the church of Philippi did not know where Paul was. And somehow word got to them that he was locked up, that he was chained to a Roman soldier. He is in Rome, waiting to hear from Nero. And so now the church of Philippi, all of a sudden, once again, had opportunity to give to the support of Paul and his necessities and his ministries. Now, Paul said, it's not that I wanted things, it's not that I wanted this money. Paul said in verse 11, not that I speak in respect of want, for I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Many of us in life, we just won't, won't, won't. Well, what, what can we get? God, give me this. God, give me that. We need to learn that God supplies our needs and he gives us not necessarily everything we want, but he gives us what we need. And we need to learn to be content with that which we have. Be satisfied. Paul learned that. And not only did he learn it, he told it to Timothy, uh, the young man that he was trying to be a mentor to. And Paul said to him in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, but godliness with great contentment is gain. It's a good thing, in other words, translation. He said, well, we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we will carry nothing out. 
Now, I've seen baby pictures of when I was a baby, and I did not have things. Only thing I had was a mom and a daddy that took care of me when I was born. But I brought nothing into this world. So anything I have that's material, there's worth anything in monetary value, I cannot take it one day when I go to heaven. It'll all be left behind. So, as Paul said, we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we'll take nothing out. And having food and raiment or clothing, let us all therewith be content. Paul said we need to learn to be satisfied with that which we have. And not be a people that covet things that other people have. So that being said, Paul in verse 11, he said, Not that I speak in respect of want, but I've learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content, to be satisfied. Paul was saying, if it's God's will that I be rich, I'll be satisfied. If it is God's will that I be poor, I will be satisfied. If God wants me to live in a big house, I will be content. If God wants me to live in a little shack, then that's okay. As long as we got Jesus, we got all we need anyway. And that's the way we need to look, we need to look at it. Now, verse 12, Paul said, I, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Now, to be abased and how to abound, what is Paul talking about there? Well, to say I, I've learned and I know how to be abased, he says I know how to, to be poor and how to struggle and hurt. And I know how to be abound, and what does he mean by that? I know how uh, it is to have things and to be wealthy as well and to have the good life. See, Paul, he was abased at times like the time when he was in that city of Philippi when he started that church and he was arrested along with his friend Silas for preaching the gospel and they were bound in shackles in a cold, dark dungeon, there also waiting what could possibly be an execution. So he learned how to be abased. But he also learned how to abound. Because when he was in that city, one of the places he and his uh, friends went to, there was a lady by the name of Lydia who was a seller of a purple dye that was very expensive. A seller of purple. She had money. She told Paul and his friends come to my house and you may stay at my house. And it was a, probably a very lavish and comfortable place to be. So he knew how to be abased. He knew how to abound. Going back to verse 12 then, Paul said, Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry. And Paul, there was times he was full, I'm sure. And we know there were times he was hungry in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty seven, 27, he tells us that he was hungry and thirsty and even without clothes that he needed. God provided. And then verse 13. I want to show you something. Verse 13. We all know this one, don't we? It's one of those verses we've all memorized. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I didn't have to look down because I know that one. Now let me tell you something, though. There are some verses, some few verses in the Bible that are taken out of their context. So we cannot take this verse, Philippians 4.13, and let it be some superman formula that we can just pray and say, God, I can do anything in this life that I want to do because you will strengthen me to do it. Got to put everything in its context. That's kind of like Matthew 19, verse 26, which says, with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible, but... The verse there is in, is, is in talking about in its context, Jesus had talked about a camel trying to go through the eye of a needle and how that's impossible. And he said, in likewise manner, man cannot save himself, but with God all things are possible. So get a bit of things in its context. In Philippians 4.13, in the context there, Paul is talking about to understand what a verse is in its context, got to look at the preceding and the postseding verses. And in the preceding verse, he said, I know how to be, to be abased and I know how to abound. I know how to be content and full and I know how to be hungry and thirsty. That's what he's talking about. He said, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. The New International Version puts it best and right when it says it this way. I can do all this 
through Christ, which strengthens me. So in other words, I can be rich, I can be poor, I can be full, I can be hungry, I can have clothes on my back, I can have a need of clothes. I can have a home to live in, I, I can be homeless and need a home. But I can do all of this, I can be anything God wants me to be, whatever is in his will, through Christ who strengthens me. Then verse 14. Notwithstanding, you have well done. That you did communicate. We think of the word communicate as talking, but the word communicate here means to impart or to give. So look at the verse there. He said, Notwithstanding, you have well done, well, well done, and that you have imparted or given to my affliction. And the word affliction there is, means needs. So he said, Church of Philippi, you have done a good job in meeting my needs. That's what he's saying there. Now, ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated or imparted to me or gave to me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only, Church of Philippi. Paul did not charge these churches anything, but he did not stop them if they wanted to voluntarily give to him in his ministry and his work. He did not charge them, he was a tent maker. But he would not keep them from giving if they felt it was God's will to give and they wanted to do it as their pleasure to give. He would receive it. But there's only one church, one group of people that gave to Paul, and it was the church of Philippi, the Philippians. So he, he, he said, uh, it was you only. So verse 16, he said, even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent once, not only once, but again unto my necessity. I, I think they kind of understood what Luke wrote in Acts 20, verse 35, when he said, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, Paul said in verse 17, for because I desire a gift, not because I desire a gift, but I desire the fruit that it may abound to your account. Paul was saying to the church of Philippi, it's not so much that I, I desire what you're giving me. You want to give me money. It's not so much that I desire it, I appreciate it, but what I desire most is that fruit is abounded into your account. Now what does that mean? Do you know that we are investing with our life into heaven? I do believe, I firmly believe, that there will be different levels of, of uh, crowns and blessings that we'll receive in heaven. For example, uh, you look at someone like Billy Graham, oh goodness, who he was, he's going to have a lot of crowns, I'm sure, uh, in heaven. Then you take someone who maybe they were into drugs and alcohol and cursed and lived a, a very sinful life, and then all of a sudden, maybe they got cancer, and they're on the bed of affliction. The doctor says, you're not going to make it. And a preacher comes in, prays the sinner's prayer, and on their deathbed, they get saved. By the skin of their teeth, they barely make it. I don't think that person, that person will have, it'll be glorious when that person would get carried away into heaven as that song was about. It'd be glorious and wonderful and absolutely splendid. But imagine how much more glorious and splendid it will be when we invest into our eternal home. Just imagine that. And Jesus taught us, taught us that in the Sermon on the Mount. He said in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, and thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth break through and steal and corrupt. These do not break through and steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So, we're investing. When we give to someone, that's an investment into our eternal home. When we forgive someone who's hurt us, that's an investment into our eternal home. When we tell someone we care about them and love them and we're praying for them and we do pray for them, that's an investment into our eternal home. There are a lot of things we do in the Christian walk, in the Christian life, that is investing into our home on the other side. 
And I think that's what Paul is saying here. He wanted fruit to abound to their account. He, it, it wasn't so much that he desired the money that the church of Philippi was giving him, but because they gave out of the generosity and the humility of their hearts, and he was receiving that, he knew that it was a blessing to them to give and that God would in turn bless them for giving. So every time we give, folks, we are giving unto the Lord. And what is it in Matthew 25, 40? It says, Jesus said, Verily, verily I say to you, and as much as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. If someone needs a, just something like on a hot day, a little cup of water, and you give that cup of water to them, it doesn't sound like much. But in God's eyes, it's very big. And God wants us to minister to others and to help one another. And, and his, his, his rewards are just endless and they're incredible. For in Luke 6, 38, Jesus himself said, Given it shall be given you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. So then, we go to verse 18. Paul said, but I, I have all. But he's, he, Paul's not saying I have everything I, I won't or I'm very wealthy or anything. No, Paul actually was wealthy at one time when he was a Pharisee named Saul. And then remember in Philippians 3, 7, he said, what things were gained to me, I kind of lost for Christ. He gave it all up. But when he says, I have all, he's saying, I have all that I need. And I abound in this. He said, I'm full. And having received of Epaphroditus. Who is Epaphroditus. If you remember early on in the study in the Philippians, we talked about Epaphroditus. He was probably the, he was a leader of the church of Philippi, if not the pastor. Some people believe he was the pastor. And when the church found out that Paul was in prison in Rome, and they're about 800 to 1,200 miles away, the church said, we got to take some money in, to help Paul with his needs. You imagine how long it would take to get there. On that treacherous journey, it would take weeks or months to go that distance. Very dangerous, very dangerous travel. So Epaphroditus volunteered. I don't know, maybe he's the pastor. And he said, I'll take the money. They took up a collection, and he was going to take it to the Apostle Paul. It took him a long time to get there, but he finally did. And if you look, it says... In verse 18, he said, I have received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, and they were an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing unto God. Hebrews 13, 16 says of such sacrifices, but to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well-pleased. But let me tell you something about that Epaphroditus fellow. If you want to flip over and look at chapter 2, you can. I'm about to wrap this thing up here. But in Philippians 2, 25 through 27, there it says this. It is supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. So Paul's, Paul's in Rome. He's chained to the soldiers. And Epaphroditus came on that long journey of over 800 miles, 1,000 miles maybe, brought him the, the money and other supplies perhaps things that he would need. And he said, I'd like to send Epaphroditus back to you, our companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered my wants, for he has loaned, verse 26 of chapter 2, for he has loaned after you all and was full of heaviness because you had heard that he had been sick, for indeed he was sick nigh unto death. Epaphroditus almost died after he delivered that gift to Paul from the Philippians. He said, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, that I should not have sorrow upon sorrow. Now, why did I, Epaphroditus almost die? Think about it. 800 to 1,200 miles. Who among us in this building right now would be willing to just take on a journey, start tomorrow, and say, let's go about 1,000 miles on a dirt road through some hills up in the mountains and a beaten path, rocks, and rough terrain, wild animals. 
Who among us would be willing to do that? It's possible that Epaphroditus had uh, a lack of water and food and just the toil on his physical body of going on that long journey. It took so much out of him that he almost died. And that man did that out of a heart of love. He was willing to go 1,000 to 1,200 miles to do that for the Apostle Paul. What a genuine child of God he was. Now, Paul was appreciative of that, greatly appreciative of it. And he said that sometimes when we give, we may not afford to to give. We may not have the resources. You know, we're in the church, and the church is to be a, we're to be a giving people. And sometimes when people have needs outside the church, we may say, I don't have the ability, I don't have the, the resources, I don't have the, the finances to be able to do it. There's an old saying which says, can't afford to give, can't afford not to give. And we see in verse 19, there is another one of those verses that people can easily take out of context. It's another one that's very popular among us, but it says, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. My God, Paul said, will supply all of your need, Church of Philippi, if you be a giving people. Even if you give to to where it hurts and you can't give no more, God will take care of you. He will take care of you. There's a hymn, right? God will take care of you. Now, notice where it says in verse 19, he will give to our needs according to his riches. Not out of his riches, but according to his riches. God owns the world. God is, God, there's nothing that he does not own. And, 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 you know, think of a billionaire. Suppose you, you came in contact with a billionaire and you told that billionaire, I've got a humongous debt. It is literally out of this world and I need some financial assistance. I could use uh, some help. Maybe you need like a $100,000. All right, what if that billionaire, he just opens his wallet and he's got several $100 bills because his pocket changed to him. What if he pulls a $100 bill out and says, here, maybe this will help you? He's a billionaire. Remember this? How much is a billion dollars? That's, what, 999 million plus another? A thousand million? So if he gives you $100, you're going to think, well, if I gave someone $100 out of my wallet, that's going to hurt. But for him, that's pocket change. So in that sense, he is giving out of his wealth, not according to. But if he says, all right, you, got, you need some help. I've been blessed. I have the resources. He pulls out a checkbook and writes a check for $100,000, hands it to you. Then that's giving according to his riches, not out of his riches. There's a difference. Jesus gives us according to his riches. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And then, all right, we now come to verse 20 that concludes. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then he gives some greetings here. And, you know, in our, our way we write letters now, we give our greetings at the beginning. Dear such and such. I, and then we offer our greetings. Hello, how you doing? Hope you're doing well. And then write the letter. They did a little different in the, these epistles. They would do the greetings at the end. And so he says, salute or give uh, my greetings to every, to every saint. Saint means called out one. We are all saints. Not that we are holy and good, perfect, pious people. But we're saints in that we are called out to serve God. And so he said, my greetings to every child, called out child of God in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you or we send our greetings to you, said Paul. All the people that were with Paul in Rome, we send our greetings by way of Epaphroditus to you, Church of Philippi. Chiefly, they that are of the Caesar's household. Who are they? It's a great debate on that. Some people believe, and I'm inclined to as well, that Paul, when he was chained to a Roman soldier, could you imagine being chained to the Apostle Paul? 
he probably wouldn't shut up. Roman soldiers are probably thinking, will you please stop? And Paul is preaching, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. And Paul would preach on and on and on and on and on. And so some of those soldiers probably got saved. And it is believed that some of them were the ones from the Caesar's household. Or it could be the common slave in the Caesar's household. We really don't know. But anyway, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. He said the same thing in chapter 1, verse 2. In every letter, he would begin with grace and he would end with grace. Paul could sit in that Roman prison, chained to a soldier, and he would be able to sing John Newton's old hymn, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. You know what the word wretch means? I looked up the word wretch. There are so many words that uh, apply to the word wretch. Um, it, is, it means a, a person who is disgraceful, reprehensible, deplorable, revolting, detestable, despicable, and contemptible person. He said, that's awful. That's what we all were. When we didn't know Christ, we were a wretch. Amazing Grace would sing Paul if he could sing that song, which was written hundreds of years later. But anyway, if it was a, a, a song of that day, he would sing Amazing Grace, so sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was as lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Thank God he gave up his life for you and me. May we do likewise and give our lives by being a people that give. Don't worry about not having what we need to give. Let's just be content with what we have and give from our hearts knowing that God will supply all our needs and he'll give us the strength to be able to do anything we need to do in life. I do thank you for listening.